Hey, this is Glover Teixeira, UFC Light Heavyweight Champion. Hi, I'm Robbie Lawler. What's up, Fight Family? This is your favorite MMA coach, Thiago Alves, the Pitbull. Hey, what's up, guys? I'm Pedro Moyo. This is Mike Brown. Guys, I am Alexei Alenik. And welcome. And welcome. And welcome. And welcome. And this is We Want One Picks. And you're watching We Want Picks. To We Want Picks. To We Want Picks. To We Want Picks. To We Want Picks. Hi, everybody from American Top Picks. My name's Angelo, and welcome to We Want Picks. UFC 271 is a few weeks away, but I'm still going to break down the main card. I'm going to walk through all of the fights, give you insight, give you my picks, and give you my bets. If you like UFC content and you want to know more about fights and have all the information that you need to win money and enjoy the show, make sure you hit the like button and make sure you subscribe to our channel. And if you want 50 free dollars, 50 bucks for free from me to you, go to wewantpicks.com slash bets, sign up with any one of our five betting partners, make a deposit, let me know, and then I will send you 50 bucks as a thank you for supporting us and our partners. It is that simple, wewantpicks.com slash bets. Let's jump right in. This is a pretty killer card and we have some solid fights. And the first fight on the UFC 271 main card is Nazrat Hakparast versus Bobby Green. Nazrat Hakparast is 13 and 4 overall. He's 3 and 2 in his last 5, coming off that surprising loss to Dan Hooker. Bobby Green is 28 and 12 overall, 3 and 2 in his last 5, and he's coming off that awesome knockout win over Al Iaquinta. Nazrat Hakparast is a very good striker. But again, he is coming off of that loss to Dan Hooker where he had absolutely no answer for the wrestling or the takedowns. And that's surprising because historically, he's had pretty good takedown defense. And even when he does get taken down, he usually pops right back up to his feet. If you ignore the Dan Hooker fight and you just go back to the Alex Munoz fight, for example, he defended eight takedowns. And Alex Munoz is a very good wrestler and grappler. And I say all this because I think the grappling loss to Hooker might have been more of a fluke than anything. He likely was not expecting to wrestle in that fight. And let's not forget, he had visa issues. His mom died the week before. And there was a lot working against Nazrat. But Nazrat is a nasty striker. He's got some really good uh, takedown defense. And he's got some decent grappling skills when he needs them. Bobby Green is a busy striker. And he's got a showboat style. But he has tons of volume and solid wrestling as a kicker. He's coming off his first knockout win in a very long time where he just straight up retired Al Iaquinta with just a textbook 1-2 combination. And before that, he had an awesome fight with Rafael Fizayev where he hung with who a lot of people will argue is the best striker in the division, and he even stole that last round. He has a Roy Jones Jr. boxing style where he keeps his hands really low, and then he jumps in and leaps in with his jabs and his rights. He's pretty good everywhere, and Bobby Green is as tough as they come. And this is an interesting matchup because Nazrat is a fantastic striker who at one point looked like he was going to be the future of the division. Bobby has always been an incredibly talented guy, but historically he didn't really live up to that potential. I think if this fight stays standing, Nazrat will have the cleaner and more powerful strikes, but Bobby is so tough that he will absolutely hang. If the fight gets to the ground, then I think Bobby has a pretty clear advantage there. The concern here is that Bobby does not always use his wrestling. And even in the fight with Fizayev, who had a pretty clear striking advantage, Bobby only had two half-assed takedown attempts. So he didn't even try to really get that to the ground, which would have been his path. And that's what makes this a tricky pick. I, I want to go with Bobby because Dan Hooker showed us what the path to victory is but you can't always trust Bobby to not fall into a striking rhythm and not keep it there. I'm still going to lean Bobby here uh, because the reality is that he's a very good striker and, and he may be outmatched, but he's still a very good striker who can hang. He's incredibly tough, but I am worried about his game planning and sometimes his poor decision-making. So really fun fight opening the main card at UFC 271. I'm leaning Bobby Green, but we'll see what happens when the fight gets a little closer. And then we have Jared Cannonier, and he's fighting the surging 
Derek Brunson. Jared Cannonier is 14 and five overall. He's four and one in his last five, and that only loss was a decision to Robert Bobby Knuckles Whitaker. Then we have Derek Brunson at 23 and seven overall. He's five and zero oh in his last five with five very dominant wins. He's put together quite the streak recently. Jared is a very powerful striker with incredible leg kicks. He switches from southpaw to orthodox. He throws kicks from both sides. He has okay grappling, but it's mostly defensive. He'll want to keep this fight standing, though. He's a he's massive for the weight class because he started his career at heavyweight and he's worked his way down. If he ends up on top, which will be pretty hard in this fight, he has tons of power and pressure, and he's impossible to get off. He just went five rounds with Kelvin Gastelum where he defended eight takedowns. So Jared Cannonier's takedown defense is pretty rock solid. Derek Brunson has been a dominant wrestler as of late. His striking continues to improve. He's mixing in his wrestling really, really well. Derek has some power, and if he threatens with takedowns, he may have some success, uh, you know, striking, but his chin is worrisome. His chin in the past has not held up as well as you would hope. Uh, what's really impressive, though, about Derek's wrestling is he added it later in his career. If you look at the first 14 fights, 14 fights of his UFC career, he had 10 takedowns total. 10 takedowns over 14 fights. Now in his last five fights, he has 19 takedowns in five fights. And he is riding that five-fight win streak. Wrestling has completely transformed how Derek Brunson fights and who he is as a fighter. And this is a really interesting matchup because it is a clash of styles. Jared with the big power and the wrestling defense against Derek with the questionable chin and the wrestling offense. I want to pick Derek here. I really want to pick Derek here. I just don't think I can. I don't think his wrestling will be good enough to get Jared down over and over. And on their feet, I think he's at a massive disadvantage. The last two people that took Jared down were Jack Hermanson and David Branch. Both of them are very high-level grapplers, and both of them were knocked out by Jared Cannonier. So I have to go with Jared here, but honestly, this is a great live betting matchup because – all we need to see is, can Derek get a takedown? So we should know that in the first few minutes of the fight. So I will have this one pulled up. I will have the live odds there, and I will be ready to smash depending on what happens. If Derek takes a half-ass shot, doesn't get it, gets cracked in the mouth, bang, Jared. If Derek has a little success, gets it to the ground, or almost gets it to the ground, then I'm definitely going to lean Derek during the live betting. And Jared Cannonier is super tough, not really uh, a guy that is finished very often. And he's already the favorite, but he may be solid for a bet of wins inside the distance, decision, no action. And what that is, if you don't know, is basically you bet on Jared Cannonier to win inside the distance, knockout, submission, whatever it is. And if he does win that way, you get paid. If it goes to a decision, and let's say he loses a decision because Derek Brunson can take him down a million times over, you get a refund. The bet never happened. You get your money back. You're good. So I love those bets. I usually like him on underdogs, but I think that's a pretty clear play here for Jared Cannonier. You're only going to get that bet, those prop bets, if you go to wewantpicks.com slash bets. Click on bet online. We have five partners and click on bet online. They have that prop bet. Make a deposit. Let me know after you do, and I will send you $50 as a thank you for supporting us and our partners. Then we have what could potentially be fight of the night. We have two really exciting guys that are always busy and always looking to make something happen. We have Kyler Phillips versus Marcelo Rojo. Kyler Phillips, 9-2 and two overall. He's 4-1 and one in his last five, coming off an awesome fight. A loss, but an awesome fight against Rulian Paeva. Marcelo Rojo is 16-7 and seven overall. He's 3-2 and two in his last five, coming off a short notice loss to Charles Jourdain in his UFC debut. Kyler Phillips is a very diverse striker. He's a well-rounded fighter overall. He can strike. He can grapple. His feet are always moving, and that's what makes him pretty difficult to hit and take down. Most of the time, Kyler does a very good job mixing things up, but he is willing to slug it out uh, to put on a show, and that can be a problem. Three out of his four official UFC fights have had performance of the night bonuses, including his last fight, which was that loss to Rulian Paeva. And if you look at the stats for that fight, it looks like he won. 
He had more strikes. He had more takedowns. But in reality, he gave up takedowns at really bad times. He made a couple really poor decisions. And his fight IQ, you know, he had some questionable decisions in that fight, which is what led to the decision loss. Marcelo Rojo is coming off the loss to Charles Jordan. But let's not forget that he took that fight on short notice and it was up a weight class. That was at 145 when he is a 135 pounder. We also can't forget that he was winning that fight. So he was winning that fight early. Ultimately, he gassed big time and he got stopped. But he did have success in that fight. He's a very exciting fighter. He comes forward with solid pressure. He's got really good hands. His offensive wrestling can use a little bit of work, but his defensive wrestling is pretty solid. And theoretically, this should be an easy pick, right? Kyler will have the more technical striking. He'll definitely be the better grappler. But the reality is he made mistakes in his last fight, which cost him the win. And it makes me question what he may do in this fight if things get a little tough. Uh, if he makes those same mistakes against a very game Rojo, he could find himself in some trouble because Marcelo Rojo has a knack for sneaking out late and surprising wins. So I do think Kyler gets this done. He gets it done with his offensive wrestling and his three takedown per fight average. But he will need to be on point and not overextend on anything. I do expect a back and forth fight. And it will likely, I will likely put a plus three and a half bet on Rojo when all of the props drop. And if you don't know what that is, basically you buy a round on the judge's scorecard. Because I do think this will be a close fight. I think they will go at it. Marcelo Rojo is incredibly tough. I, I don't expect him to gas in this fight because he'll have a full camp. And if I buy one round on the judge's scorecard, all he needs to do is win one actual round. And he's such a game fighter, he could take a round from Kyler Phillips, especially if Kyler makes some of those poor decisions. Or another inside the distance decision, no action, because Marcelo Rojo can catch people in random spots even when he's losing. So if you grab yourself a wins inside the distance decision, no action, again, if Marcelo Rojo pulls it off, gets himself a finish, you get paid. If he loses a decision, well, you get a refund. It's no big deal. And both of those prop bets, you're only going to get if you go to wewantpicks.com slash bets. We have five different betting partners. Bet Online is the partner that offers those cushioned prop bets, those safety net prop bets. So go there, make a deposit, let me know after you do, and I will send you $50 as a thank you. Cash App, PayPal, Venmo, 50 bucks from me to you as a thank you for supporting us and our partners. Then we have the co-main event of the evening. We have a fun heavyweight matchup with two guys that have solid chins and incredible power in their hands. It could be a snooze fest, but let's hope it isn't. We have Derek Lewis versus Ty Tuivasa. Derek Lewis, 26 and 8 overall, 4 and 1, coming off the first round knockout of Chris Dawkins. Ty Tuivasa is 14 and 3 overall, 4 and 1 in his last five, riding a four fight knockout streak. And Derek Lewis, we've broken this guy down a million times, and it's almost the same read every single time. He has two sledgehammers attached to his hands. He has incredible power and very low output, almost as if it's just so exhausting to swing those things around that he really has to pick his spots. Uh, he, doesn't, he doesn't set you up. He doesn't batter you down. He just one-shot knockout power, and that's where his wins come from. It's one shot, either puts you out cold, gets you rocked, and then he'll close in from there. He is a low-volume striker. He waits for you to come in. And if you come in and you leave an opening, he will throw a heavy punch and put your lights out. He is not particularly fast. He's not very technical. But he has a very good chin, and he has enough power to knock out a horse. His power keeps him in fights. If you go back to the Volkov fight, the dude was one minute away from losing a very clear decision, and then one punch changed absolutely everything. Same with the Curtis Blades fight. He was taken down, but he didn't panic. He just waited for the one punch, and he got it. He does have a pretty good get-up game that literally consists of him getting up. He will be taken down. You could be on him. You could have it, and boom, stands, just stands up like, like if I'm wrestling with my daughter. Just goodbye. I'm up now. I don't imagine he'll need that in this fight, though. Tai Tuivasa is also a very heavy-handed striker. He's got solid volume. He mixes in kicks really well. He moved to American Kickboxing Academy a few camps ago, and it has showed. He was always fast and powerful for his size, 
but he's much sharper now. He's much more composed recently. Tui Vasa has fantastic leg kicks, a piercing jab, and a big overhand. His takedown defense is just okay at 50%, and he has zero offensive takedowns in the UFC. But you could argue that Tai Tui Vasa's biggest asset is his chin. He has a cement head, and he's not a guy that's easily knocked out. What makes this such a hard fight to pick is we saw Greg Hardy rock Tai Tui Vasa. And if that exact same punch landed from Derek Lewis instead of Greg Hardy, it probably would have been lights out. And it's always the same read on Derek Lewis. He's not the better striker, but he has so much power that it doesn't matter. This fight's a little different because I don't think Ty is afraid to get hit. His chin is so good. He's relied on it for years. I don't think he's afraid to get hit. And it'll be interesting because he'll get hit and Derek Lewis will put him out as he does everybody else. Or it may actually frustrate Derek Lewis because Ty Duivasa is going to be there. He's not afraid to get hit. And, and let's say Derek Lewis does crack Ty Duivasa and nothing happens. Uh, Derek may have an oh shit moment where he doesn't know what to do with that. So that could be very, very interesting. Um, you know, I don't know. I love Ty Tuivasa. I want to see another shoey. And I like his leg kicks to switch things up. I like him to win this fight. But obviously getting knocked out is very plausible. So I'm going with Ty Tuivasa here. Again, he's the better striker. He's got better, he's more diverse. He's got low kicks. He's got high kicks. He mixes up his strikes really well. Look at the volume difference. 2.53 strikes per minute to 4.63 strikes per minute. So I like Tai Tuivasa to win this fight, but if he gets flatlined, I don't think anybody will be surprised. Main event of the evening, we have Israel Adesanya versus Robert Whitaker. Israel Adesanya is 21-1 and overall. 4-1 and in his last five, and that lone loss was to Jan Blahovich when he went up in weight class to try to win the light heavyweight title. Robert Whitaker is 24-4 and overall. He's 4-1 and in his last five, and he's coming off of three very one-sided decision wins. And this fight's a rematch. So let's talk about the first fight from two years ago. Izzy won that fight by TKO in the second round. The first round was a lot of Robert Whitaker literally charging forward, throwing big jabs and then giant right hands behind it. He did have some success. It landed a few times. And honestly, I would have scored that round for Robert if Izzy didn't just straight drop him at the end of that round. The second round was more the same. Robert took the center of the octagon, made it a brawl. He had success. He even landed a solid head kick, but Izzy slowly started to win those exchanges and with short hooks, and he eventually dropped and finished Robert Whitaker. Israel Adesanya is an amazing kickboxer at middleweight. He looks almost unbeatable. He times his shots really well. He's a great counter striker with a good chin. He will literally roll his shoulders, bob his head, while his opponents throw a ton of punches in his direction. Almost nothing lands, and he quickly fires back with short hooks and straights. His takedown defense is solid at 80%, but Jan and Marvin Vittori both were able to take him down multiple times. Robert Whitaker is a very diverse striker. He has really good volume. He's incredibly active. He's constantly mixing up his striking and movement patterns. He will lay out really heavy leg kicks and then immediately charge forward and chase the head. After the loss to Izzy, Robert took almost a year off to be with his family, to handle personal issues, as he said, which we still don't know what they were. Uh, and when he came back, he looked like a different fighter. He completely dismantled Darren Till, Jared Cannonier, Kelvin Gastelum. And what's interesting about those fights is while Robert kept his aggressive striking, he seemed more measured and he worked in way more takedowns. In his first 14 UFC fights, he's had four takedowns. In his last three fights, he's had six. He's had more takedowns in his last three fights than his first 14 fights combined. Very similar to the Derek Brunson story we just told. What's really interesting here is that Whitaker has let the world know what his game plan is. He literally said on more than one occasion that Jan Blahovich gave everybody the blueprints on how to beat Israel Adesanya, and I am going to follow that blueprint. So what does that mean? Then uh, Robert Whitaker plans on hanging with Izzy, taking him down, and then riding him out on top. 
And it's easier said than done, though, because Marvin Vittori just took Izzy down four times in June, and he still lost that fight. And it's really tough to call this fight because Izzy has proven that he can knock out Robert Whitaker. He proved it. He showed us he already knocked out Robert Whitaker, and he proved that even when he gets taken down, he has some surprises on the ground. He swept Marvin Vittori twice, two reversals in that fight. He was taken down four times, and two times he reversed those positions. So is forward aggression alone, like if Robert Whitaker didn't get knocked out, this is going to sound so stupid. If Robert Whitaker didn't get knocked out in the first fight, I think he was going to win that fight. His forward aggression alone was winning him rounds, and he could have won. Obviously, he was knocked out and he lost, but my point is, is if he can fight that exact same fight, avoid the big power, work in some takedowns, this is absolutely his fight to win. I want to pick Whitaker here. I want to pick him very badly. And I think he's one of the most live underdogs on this card, but I just think, I think Izzy will get it done. I think he will sneak it out in a close fight. I think Izzy's more prepared for the wrestling than he has been in the past. I think he'll have some surprises on the ground. I do think Robert Whitaker is going to have a ton of success on his feet. I don't think he'll get stopped though. So to me, I think this is a really good Robert Whitaker plus five and a half point bet. So again, it's just like the plus three and a half point where you're buying points on the judges' scorecards and all Robert will need to do is, is steal a couple rounds on the judges from the judges and then I bought the rest of it and then that bet is mine. And he's a solid underdog here. So you might even be able to get plus money on that because I think the odds makers are expecting Robert to get knocked out, which I don't think happens. I think he makes this a close, competitive, action-packed fight. He probably loses a decision because he'll be on the wrong side of a lot of those exchanges. But I do like Robert Whitaker buying points on the scorecard as an underdog to cash out. And you're only going to get that at wewantpicks.com slash bets. Sign up, make a deposit with Bet Online. I'll send you 50 bucks and they have those safety net prop bets. Guys, thanks for watching this breakdown. We'll do a full detailed full card breakdown when we get a little bit closer to the fight. Let me know your picks in the comments below. Make sure you subscribe, like the video, and I'll see you soon.